evening everybody, we're in Acts chapter 9. I haven't, I've written down a few little notes, but I hope that you're all going to interject and come up with your comments. Um, pick up from where we left off last week, really. Um, we, uh, we'll say we're going to start from Acts 9 verse 20. Let's just have a look at them then the last two verses where we finished last week, which was verses 18 and 19. If you remember, we're talking about Saul. Um, he couldn't see because um, he had a vision of Jesus. Jesus had met him. And it says in verse 18, Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptised. And we talked about that, didn't we, about him being baptised. Mm -hmm. And so when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And that was where we ended up last week. We talked about that a little bit. Look at verse 20, okay? Look. Immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. <laughs> he didn't sort of preach from the New Testament, did he? He didn't have the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Okay. What did he do? What did he do? What did he have? What did he have? He was a witness. Yeah, he preached what he was a witness to. In actual fact, he used his testimony. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, each one of us has got a testimony. You might think, well, my testimony is not particularly interesting, but it is. We're all different. Mm -hmm. It's the most powerful thing you have. Nobody can contradict your testimony. Mm -hmm. Nobody can tell you you weren't saved the way you were saved. Well, that didn't happen, or you know, it wasn't like this, because you were the one that happened to. Mm -hmm. They can't argue with it. And, and your argument is, it brought me into a relationship with the Lord Jesus, and no one can deny that. They can't say, no, it didn't. You're a living witness to it. So... <laughs> Sometimes, you know, we neglect our testimony, but it's a powerful tool. And what I was thinking about is really we, we need to brush up on that. Paul used it. Sunday morning, we've got people coming. There might be some unsaved people here who you start talking to. Who knows? There might be, a, there might be the opportunity to put your testimony into the conversation and say what the Lord has done for you. I don't know, but there might be. Might the God might just open that door. Are you ready to share it? You know, is it sort of fresh enough in your mind? You know, have you run it through enough to be able to share your testimony? Um, and I think maybe it's good for us to, you know, go over it ourselves, but also amongst ourselves sometimes, you know. And I think maybe in a couple of, well, no, a couple of months' time when I'm doing the next um, Sunday morning, we'll get in a circle and we'll see who's brave enough to share their testimony that morning. You know, one or two might put their hand up. It's a good thing. I don't think you ever feel bad for sharing your testimony. All right, so... Paul actually used the Old Testament, but he actually spoke about what happened to him. He'd been transformed, he'd met Jesus you know, in a spectacular way. We, we may think, well, it wasn't spectacular for me, but whatever way you came to the Lord is your way, and that's your testimony. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let, let's sort of think about that carefully, right? You know, our testimony is an important thing that the Lord has given us. That's, what he's got, that's the tool he's given you, and you've got to use it, really, you know, to use and share your testimony. I don't know what you've got to say about that, but I think that's an important thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, the other thing is, not just your testimony, but have a couple of Bible verses. Even if you can't remember them, write them down in the back of your Bible. And so if anybody starts to talk to you, you can share your testimony, and you can give them a couple of Bible verses that mean something to you and can mean something to them. Remember that the Word of God is a living thing. You know, saying on Sunday morning, it's a, a sharp two-edged... Uh, I was saying something like, actually, it's a two-edged sword, isn't it? The word of God, it can cut, it can divide. It sorts things out. And, um, you know, have a couple of verses of scripture. Learn them, write them in your Bible, with your testimony, and when the opportunity comes, share them. Uh, we've already said that the Lord will give you the words to speak anyhow, but pray about it, you know, ask the Lord to give you the boldness to do it. I mean, it's, a, it's a, such an important thing. Paul shared the Old Testament scriptures, and I believe he must have shared his testimony. So I don't know if you've got any other thoughts on that. But. Well, the encouraging thing for me that gets me with sometimes, sometimes people think I find it easy, but obviously it's like anything, you don't find it easy sometimes, you know. Um, but it's to pray for those opportunities. But more importantly, what keeps me on the spirit, as it were, is the thought that one day I'm going to stand before Jesus. And it isn't a walk into heaven, it's a first of all conversation that she has with us about what we've been up to. Because yeah. it says that. And I don't want to be reminded by Jesus at that point. Of saying, well, you're in here, you're in the land of love, but I need to share this with you. You failed me, Lord. Yeah. And I just do not want that. And that's what drives me on. 
I do not worry in their life. Yeah. No. So that's a personal way that yeah. I see it. I just see, you know, I want to go to heaven and walk straight in. Yeah. Well, well, Paul says we'll get a bunch of skin of our teeth, but we don't want to be reprimanded for something that we can do something about, do we? For being lazy, you know. I mean, we all want, really, the Lord to say, well done, though, good and faithful servant. But we, we want him to say that, but are we going to be faithful? You know, we, you know we've, got to, we've got to do what he's asked us to do. He actually says at the end of Matthew, you know, go into all the world, preach, teach, and make disciples, you know. That's our, that's our task, to share our testimony, to share the word, uh, and to bring new life into people's lives, really, you know, through the power of the Spirit. Yeah. So, you know, let's pray about that. And um, that's something, if we don't take anything else home tonight, let's take that home, you know, that we can, mm-hmm. we've got that, and that's something that we can use, isn't it? Um, as I say, our own, par- it's a, our own story is a powerful tool, no one can contradict it. But we see here that Saul is a, a transformed man, okay? Mm-hmm. He really is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, and I was always taken along to church. Didn't always enjoy it. But the big thing for me, and I think a lot of people will notice that who grew up in a Christian home, when you become a Christian in many ways, life doesn't change a lot. You, you might be able to relate to that. It's not like you suddenly stop going down the, the pub and all of that, because you never did it anyhow. You know, if you grew up in church, you didn't really do that. But, so it's not that real huge, big sort of turnaround. But whatever, whatever way you look at it, you are a changed person. Because the moment, even in the Christian family, you become a Christian, you give your life, you know that something's changed. It's almost like somebody switched a diverter on and you're going on a different track. Even though, you know, you're still in the same family, something's changed. Paul is a changed man. It was a radical transformation for Paul, wasn't it? You know, but... For all of us, there's a transformation the moment we give our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. We can all relate to that, I'm sure. Maybe it's not in a big way like it was for Saul, but there is a change. And Saul is a, a really a, a transformed man when you, when you look at these verses and you see, I mean, he's breathing threatenings and slaughter one minute, and the next minute he's promoting the very thing he's trying to destroy. And only the Lord can do that. You know, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing, really, isn't it, that God can completely turn a man like Saul round transform him completely and uh, I th- you, you imagine <laughs> you imagine being one of those disciples there with him and and seeing Saul speak like this I'd love to have seen it because he was speaking in the power of the spirit you know, and, and people must have stood there with their mouths wide open you know one moment they're terrified of him the next minute he's their champion you know he's He's a, it's an incredible transformation really um, and I think the disciples who saw that those Christians who saw this must have been encouraged in themselves as well. I'm sure it must have been an encouragement for them. Uh, and for us to read about it, I think, is an encouragement. But you imagine actually being there and seeing this man completely turn around. You know, he described himself as a vile little man, didn't he, Saul? But here he is, you know, battling off for God. And, and remember, we were talking about he was, he was trained by Gamaliel. This is a bloke who knew the Old Testament scriptures inside out and backwards, and the Jews couldn't argue with him. <laughs> they couldn't get one over the top of him. He, he was far better, far more educated, far more well-versed than most of them were. And here he is. He's now preaching that the Lord Jesus Christ is a Messiah. It's incredible, really, isn't it? How God turned him round, you know. I really, you know, to me, you know, when I sort of read these verses, I just think... Can I just share something? This is really... James, Jamie, and I'll speak about Jamie, he's not here, but he's here, I know I could say this, because I've said it before, he's been here. On Sunday, Sarah, who's getting the girls from, um, was shocked at what it was like before. She didn't know. Mm. She could not get her head around when Jamie shared his testimony with her. How he was before, this is only a year and what ago? Two years. Two years ago. He's changed so much because he left the peace of Christ mm. that first night before he became a Christian. And she actually said on Sunday morning, we were sharing that with she actually said, I cannot believe this story he tells me about what he was like. Mm. She's not seen a bit of it, not an inch of it. And I can also tell you, Lord Tolmash and others on that stage would share the same testimony. Mm. There are people in the reenactment as well. People in the reenactment who we know mm. have mm. said the same thing. They cannot believe it's the man that came through that door in the morning. Mm. So that's the fact. Now, that's a simple testimony. Mm-hmm. He wasn't hit on the Damascus Road, he wasn't in a car crash. He just simply said, you don't believe in God, God gave him a word, he grabbed a piece of your word and stared at it and said, go, good luck with that, mate, and walked off. Next morning he phoned me out and said, I can't believe it. 
and he changed that much. That's his testimony. Mm. Mm. And because of that, he gave his life to Jesus. Mm. Because of that. Yeah. Yeah. So Sarah, I really believe, has been brought into his life in this wonderful prayer. It's just in awe of it. Mm. You can't get rid of it. What a witness. What a yeah. Yeah. And that's what Paul was done. Yeah, it? yeah, what completely. And I think, yeah. you know... <laughs> When people saw that, I mean, they, they just must have been, like you say, totally amazed, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's the power of God, isn't it? Yeah. But the thing is, we shouldn't be amazed, should we, as Christians? We shouldn't be amazed, you know. But this is the sort of thing that the early church was seeing all the while, and we've lost it a little bit, really, haven't we? You know, we, we need to be sort of praying that the Lord brings it back into the churches, that we see people coming who are unlikely and that they, they be, they're saved, you know. But nobody's beyond the power of the gospel. You know, nobody's beyond the reach of the gospel at all. Um, I put, um, as I said, yeah, well, I said Paul was extremely well talked to yeah. Um Well, we see in verse 21 that he, he, and verse 22, he confounded and he baffled the Jews, right? And, but I get the impression, I don't know if you read, you read verses 21 and 22, do you get the impression that um, Paul's, pre even despite his powerful preaching, that the Jews were still trying to put him down? Because verse 22 starts with a but. This is chapter 9. You read those verses through there. I'll read, I'll read some of them. Immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who uh, destroyed those who were called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose, that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, Proving that Jesus is the Christ, and he used those. He used the Old Testament scriptures to prove that Jesus is the Christ. The Jews had this all the while; they've still got it. It's in the scriptures that they have that you know that you can prove the Lord Jesus is the Messiah. Mm. And yet they refuse to believe then, and many still do today. Um, but by the time we get to sort of verse twenty-three, the Jews have had enough of Saul. Look. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Now, I, I want to talk about, I've got to tell you, I'm going to talk about the sale on Sunday morning. You think, oh, I've heard that a million times. But, you know, it's the, it's the stony heart, isn't it? They've got the hard heart. They, they, kill, they, they killed the Lord Jesus. They crucified Jesus. They stoned Stephen to death at Saul's, you know, Saul's presence there. And now it's Saul's turn. They want to kill him. It's destroy the message. And it's satanic, isn't it? Mm. and when we come across that today it's satanic when people want to destroy the message it's satanic mm. we live in a world where Satan's fully active and yet if we talk about him people think you're crazy mm. Mm. Yeah, he's, you know, he's alive and kicking really hard at the moment but you see it's quite hard to understand because these Jewish people want to kill Saul and stone steam to death crucified Jesus they're actually defending God in their own mind aren't they mm. They're trying to defend their uh, way, their belief, their way of life, and the way they understand God. You know, the Lord your God is one God. How could this Jesus claim to be God? And it's a, it's sometimes a hard one for us to explain as well. But we come across difficult circumstances um, in life when we try to explain the gospel a lot of the time. But Saul did it in the power of the Spirit, and that's how we do it. <laughs> if you think you're going to go out there and convert people and explain to them in your wisdom, you know, you ain't going to get nowhere. <laughs> Because we don't know enough. There's going to be people out there far more clever than we'll ever be. But if we present them with the gospel and we present them with the Bible and the word of the God, with them and the word of God through the Spirit, they can't argue against it. They might turn their backs on you and walk away, but they can't gainsay it. And we should take, you know, some, some strength from that, you know, and courage from that. That when we speak the word of God, He's there behind, right beside us and pushing it forward. And um, if you say, I don't know about that, well, try it. <laughs> If you, if you want to find out if it's true, try it out. You know, I've said it before, but a while ago, I mean, we've got a neighbour, he's totally anti-church and everything. And um, Patty kept saying to me, invite him to church, invite him to church. I said, he won't come, he won't come. She said, tell him he can come for dinner. <laughs> I said, he still wouldn't come. His wife had gone on holiday. I said, he won't come in for dinner. And he's a pig. <laughs> so I went and I said, Mike... Will you come? To, do you want to come for dinner? He said, "Yeah, I love to." I said, "Right, you've got to come to church first. That's all right." He said, "All right, I'll come." <laughs> what? Okay, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You see, but once you actually yeah. do it, yeah. that 
people are not as offended as you think they're going to be. You've scared yourself before you've done it. <laughs> Haven't you? Sometimes people are more than happy to come. You know, they want to find out. You know, a lot of people don't know anything about church. They've never walked in. I took a lad to church one day and he sat outside in the car for five minutes shaking before he dare go through the door. I said, what are you worried about? He said, I've never been in before. I went, what happens? What goes on? I said, come in and find out. He was terrified. People are like that. They don't know what happens inside these doors. Mm -hmm. But if we don't ask them, they're not going to find out. Mm -hmm. And so this week, I've been anybody who I think might be remotely interested, I've been asking them to come along Sunday. I hope if they all come, we've had it. <laughs> but, you know, why not? Mm -hmm. you know, we've got to start, you know, try to be bold through, through the strength of the Lord. You know, ask for the Holy Spirit to give us the courage to do it. And, um, you know, look at verses 24, 25. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night. They wanted to do him harm, right? But they couldn't. They couldn't. Okay? The disciples let him down, took him by night and let him down through the wall in the large basket. God was watching out for him. God had got a plan for Saul, you see. Although they wanted to harm him, they weren't going to, because God was going to guide him through. Uh, he doesn't get away scot-free. His, his life is a real hard life, you know. But God is not going to ha have him thwarted at this early stage, you know. Paul has got a lot to do for the Lord, and so have we. We used to sing the hymn, there's a work for Jesus, ready at your hand, right? And there is. Do we want to do it? So easy to hide behind other things, isn't it? But, you know, maybe we ought to be praying about all of these things. There's so much to pray for when you're home, and you're in your quiet time at home. There's a lot to pray for. You know, and, and you know, we, we can easily cruise along in our Christian lives, you know, but really we're meant to be quite active. You know, the, the, the Christian life is an active life, really. Not, not a life where we shelter behind, well, I, you know, I'm a bit nervous and that, you know. All the facilities, all the tools we want are there. We've just got to ask the Lord to give them and to get us out there to use them. And that's, I'm not saying it's easy. You know, speaking to people is not always going to be easy. You know, you know, it's not, but... Unless we practice it, unless we try it, we're never going to know. Who knows somebody you meet tomorrow might love to come to church on Sunday morning. They just might want to come, you know, that might be just what they're looking for. You don't know what they're going through. You know, I was speaking to my brother Graham, right, and he says to me, people think they're on this earth to enjoy themselves. They're not. They're here to get through it, but we're here to serve the Lord as we go through it. Nowhere are we promised that life's going to be a bed of roses. It's not about all enjoying yourself, you know. Life's a lot of battles. Jesus says, I'll be with you through to the end of it. He doesn't say you're going to enjoy all of it. You know, a, he, said, he said, I promise you this, I had tribulations, you'll have tribulations as well. And we do. You know, that life's not plain sailing and a lot of people are up against it. We've got the Lord Jesus and a lot of people haven't got that. Saul, so, you know, he's, they want to kill him, but the Lord Jesus is watching over him. And people want that. People want to know that the Lord Jesus is there to watch over him and to help him to be with them and see him through the trials of life. And we've got the key. In actual fact, Jesus had a go at the Pharisees. He said, you, you hold the key to truth, and yet you are making it impossible for people to unlock the door and find that truth. And if we've got the key of truth and we've hidden it in our back pocket, we're doing the same thing. So, you know, we, we have got a duty as Christians to, to get out there and share with people and, and just to, you know, encourage them, ask people to, you know, they'd have to come to church. Do you want me to visit you and talk to you in your home, read the Bible in your home if they can't get out or whatever, you know. I don't know what you think, this is what I think we should do, but you may have different ideas, but you can say what you want and say, no, that's not the right way, I don't do it, I don't work that way, I work another way. Well, good. But has anybody got any comments? Because I haven't got the sole rights on things and none of us have, but people have got different ways of working. But I just believe we're in, we're, I think we're in terrible times. Right? I think we look around the world and the days are short. Mm -hmm. How much time are we going to waste? You know, how much time are we going to dilly and dally and dither before we think, I better get my finger out and start doing something? Yeah, I don't know if people got thoughts on that. I don't know. <laughs> no? Yeah? Well, I think Romans 6, 7, 8 really says it all. It's the normal Christian life. Yeah. You know, what the challenge to each of us, you know, myself and me, is do I want the normal Christian life? And the, and the question must be, do you know what the normal Christian life is? Because if you don't know what the normal Christian life is, do you know you're not living it? And what's for me, a really good book, absolutely superb. Um, and it 
that's so important. God created us for his pleasure. That's why he created us. There is no other reason he created us. Hmm. It's not for us to go out preaching to people. Not us to do all these other things. First thing is for his pleasure. So we say to him, what would really pleasure you do? You know, what is it in my life? If you don't want to share this, mm -hmm. what's in my life that pleases me? God's thing is that he wants a personal relationship with us. Mm -hmm. I know Christians who go on all the mission stuff, they do all this hard work, and if he looks on paper, you think, wow. Mm -hmm. No sins, no fruit, no nothing. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the world, it's terrible. No, it's not the world. It's you, my brother. <laughs> You're not going to Jesus first. You've not got no relationship with God. It's a religion. Mm. And that's what turns a lot of people from the church. In our village, we've got people who have been so hurt by church, you could weep. We've been trying to break bridges. We're trying to share with people without them feeling any pressures because they've been so hurt. That's why I say you can go in their homes and, and mm -hmm. read and pray them in yeah, their homes. Yeah, but no, they won't do that. That's right. what I'm saying. This is what they would say. So I'll go and write that. So what, how do we know then how to do this is what my question is. Right? And Romans tells you, anything we do in our flesh is a sin. Mm -hmm. yes, so if I say I'm going to go and preach the gospel to that man over there, and God hasn't asked me to, that's a sin. This is what what we write about. This is what Romans is all about. Grace is God extending his hand out to you and saying, I trust you so much, I want you to go and do this for me. Now the problem for us is, how do we get into that routine? Because we've got so much of the world on us. You say about people who are in Christian homes. They've got loads of Christian garbage that's not even what Jesus wants on them. So their walk's different to someone who perhaps changes for them. So what I'm saying is, the first port call must be for our own quiet time with the Lord, that we get changed, that we want to come closer to Jesus so that we can please him, the pleasure. Once we hit that thing and we understand that, the rest just flows. God just speaks to you. He'll say to you, speak to that person in the supermarket. Go and speak to the friend next door and ask him to do this because he knows their hearts. And he's got you in a place where you're listening. That's why motor flight clubs, that's why car clubs are all having the time of them going. Terrible things. Social clubs are all collapsing. Why? Because they're all doing it in the flesh. Nobody wants to go to these places. Mm. The difference is when you've got living Jesus. So, so what I'm saying is, my first port call is to change me to be more like Jesus. And the only way I do that is to be honest and say, Lord, I'm going to spend time in the Word and in prayer, and I'm expecting you to use me, to speak to me. Mm, yeah. And I, I, and this is, I know it's an I in this, and Paul, I think it's chapter 7 in, in Romans, tells you the whole comment, the word I. You go and tip it, go and learn yellow marker, every I that Paul says. Because Paul wrote that chapter to show the problem he had in preaching and teaching. Mm. It's all about him as a Pharisee. And then suddenly he discovered grace. And this is what he's saying, and this is what's important, is that if we can just get off the flesh of doing things that we think God would like rather than doing the things he's asked us to do then he will his church mm. it's that simple mm. it breaks my heart when I see men and women working so hard I mean we've been in trouble in the past in our Christian war because we've turned down to do things and people go it's terrible it's selfish I say no God didn't ask me to do it mm. you know yeah, the yeah. Uh, it, the but the Lord does tell us to go and uh, out into all the world. You know, we've got to be. You know, we. Well, oh, that's just one scripture. That's uh, that is one yeah, scripture, yeah. But that is a commission, isn't it? That we've got to go into the world. I think scripture says that He gave some evangelists. Some, yes. You know, yes. there's different elites. Yeah. Roles. Yeah. And yes. not everyone has that. No. And the thing is, Nick, if you let's just say. God, and I've got a good idea. Somebody down the road, I want to start a centre for starting Afghan Zoom coming up. I think it's a good idea. God said, go into the world. I've got all the scriptures that back mm. me doing it. Yeah. And God hasn't asked me. Because he's going to ask you, Nick. Because he can see something in you that I haven't got that's going to touch those people that really going to move that ministry. Jackie Pullinger did this. That young woman going to Hong Kong yeah. when the church said she shouldn't go. Mm. She knew Jesus told her to go. The cheap tribe guy becomes a born again Christian. Yeah. So you go and do it, and I'm saying, God, what do you want me to do? And you could be 
he's saying to me, and this is where a lot of religious Christians have a problem, I don't want you to do anything. All I want you to do is sit at the back of the room for a while. Because I want to get to know you more, and I want you to know me more. And but then he says, never. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, th- I think we've all got different callings anyhow, haven't we? You know, mm-hmm. some people are, are good at one thing and some people are good at another. And, mm-hmm. You know, it's like um, a lot of people who, are, they say they're a pastor of the church, but they're, they're sometimes they're absolutely terrible with um, being friendly with people. Do you know what I mean? They might be a, good, they might be a preacher, right? but they can't mm-hmm. be normal with people. You know, we, we, aren't, we haven't got all the gifts. Mm-hmm. We're not good at everything. Mm-hmm. You know, God, God, as Nick says, God says, or the Lord says, some are good at this, or some have got the gift of that, some have got the gift of that. And then up to a point, you know, we do need to know what our calling is. Mm-hmm. We've got to know totally. Yeah. Sorry, I've got to say that. Yeah, well, we have, we've got to know what we're, what we're called to do. I'm brilliant at running business, by the way. Do you know that? <laughs> and do you know how I am? I once could earn £1,000 an hour in the 80s. I ran an advertising agency. I was so brilliant at running agencies. I was headhunted at 18 by one of all the biggest apps I want to see. I'm really good at it, right? That's my flesh. That's me. Yeah. I'm good at it. When I became a Christian, God took a long while, and he, he's my witness to all this, it was a long while before God pulled me out of advertising. Mm. Because he had to get me at the right place to do it. I'm not meant to run businesses. I'm not meant to. That's a gift of God, but it's not one from God. Mm. Yeah. That was my flesh and up yeah. God's had to change me. I mean, God put me down work on the streets with people I couldn't stand. I couldn't, I'd pity people. And he too, he said, well, I was in trouble, didn't I? I don't want the streets. And yet God knew that's what my gift in is, that I can work with the really rough and ready, hard to be people. I love it now. God could see what I couldn't see. So what I'm saying is I'm passionate about this, is if God hasn't told you to do it, we shouldn't be doing that. Mm, no, that's right. I think we we, we can go ahead and say, well, look, I feel I want to do this, and we know that's wrong, you know, um, unless God really has put it on your heart to do it. I mean, we think of people like William Carey and that, you know, yeah. who's turned down, turned down, but he's insists he's right. And, you know, yeah, yeah, and Hudson Taylor, a lot of these people had to work against the authorities and powers that be and go ahead and do what they wanted to do. Um, because that's what the Lord laid on their heart. And I think we, we have to be aware of that too, you know. We, we can't just go and say, oh, it would be great if I do this and I can win people over the Lord. You can't. No, no there's no way you can do that. I mean, we, we've got to be realistic about that. Sometimes opportunities come our way the Lord just presents us with and we can speak mm. a word out. But we're not all called to be evangelists. We're not all called to be, you know, whatever we might you know, want to be, you know. There's a lot of people who want to be things that they're not called to be. They, they, they think they, they're good at it, but they're not. So we have to pray about all of these things, really. Mm. Um, but we're all good at giving our own testimony. <laughs> Each one of us can do that, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think we should be prepared to do that. We're called mm-hmm. to do that. Well, yeah, because again, you give it to the person God has put to Yeah, you yeah, you're in that service. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And when I was at Cornwall Baptist Church, they were going to give out leaflets over the whole of Cornwall in Sheffield. And I said to Chas, there's one question in my Saturday, do it next. And me and the chap called uh, uh, Jason, Jason Clark. We said, and Chad said, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to pray about it. And we prayed, and God gave us three houses for three leaflets. Mm-hmm. And me and Jason, and Chad said, he's really good one. He said, well, you three go, you go and do that, and we'll do the rest of the thing. We were the only ones invited in. We were the only ones that a man said to us, well, you're not doing for I've been waiting for you. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make me special, which annoyed Jason. But what it did make us was we were willing to save God. Mm-hmm. We haven't got time to spend a whole day saying, who do you want to have these leaflets? And he gave us three addresses. I didn't need no good enough. I was in suffering. And he gave us three addresses. And Jay said, oh, I'm going to go. We went and got it. And the man was waiting there for us. Mm. Yeah. It's that yeah. exciting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Chase didn't get any of them. No, I, I, I did actually pray back going to see your brother this morning, Anne, and I said, Lord, I know what he's like, and I said, Lord, if he doesn't come to the door, I'm not meant to go there, and if he opens the door, I'll go in. And I stopped my motorbike, motorbike outside, and he came straight out. Why? Pardon? I said, oh, he was, I don't mind, I don't mind. He knows, he, the Lord will make an appointment for us, he knows. But he was, this is what happened. He, you know, I said to the Lord, you know, do you want me to speak to... My old mate, and, he, and if, he's, if if um, if you do, Lord, he'll open the door. And he was standing at the door. He did. I, he's got it open. I thought, well, I'm straight in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. You know, it's, it's, 
we don't actually have to speak to people about the law because the, if we if we live that life as on the homeless, sometimes they'll say they want something that we've got. We live the gospel, we, and, and normally that will be an opportunity for, for them to ask us questions or ask on the process. You don't have to, you know, get the Bible and start quoting. They can see it in your life, and they'll think they've got something. Well, we are told to live our lives in such a way that people will see that. Mm -hmm. aren't exactly. So, so you can let, the case of not being up here, let, let your lives, you know, let your life shine. Come here, be yeah. fruit, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. joy, peace, and all yeah. Yeah. that. That is a witness in itself, isn't it, to the world, the yeah. way we live. So that's part of the Bible. So we don't want to talk to the evangelists, but if we live it, yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. I think someone said. Preach the gospel at all times. Sometimes use words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sometimes use words. Yes, right. Yeah. 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 Life. yeah. Well, we could go on for a lot longer tonight, but I think. Um... Okay. Hang. All right. Uh, Steve just got something. Um, because uh, like I'm here because I've got to indoors in a way. Yeah. Good one to meditate, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for that, thank yeah. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's well worth putting on the wall to, for us all to read, isn't it, I think, as well. See you, bye. Goodbye. Bless everybody. Hope you've been out here all that we've said. <laughs> Hope you can.